I'm Gabriel Weintraub. I'm a faculty member here at Columbia Business School. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to have Mr. Paolo Roca give a guest lecture uh, for us today. Mr. Roca is the chairman and CEO of Tenaris, a global manufacturing firm. So here we have uh, four clusters of our core operations management class, two from Professor Kari Chan, two uh, that uh, are, are with me. And we also have other distinguished uh, members of our community. We have uh, members of LABA, the Latin American Association, of the Commodities Club uh, as well. And this is a great timing for our course. So we were just talking about uh, lean operations and quality in the last uh, one or two classes. And who better to discuss and talk about these topics than uh, Mr. Paolo Roca, who was awarded the Deming Cup for operational excellence for his work in Tenaris. So to present Mr. Roca, let me introduce you to Professor Freiman, who is uh, really the mind and force behind uh, the Demin Cup that has really put Colombia in the forefront of operational excellence. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Uh, my name is Nelson Freiman. I'm also a faculty member at CBS since 1995. And it's a pleasure to introduce one of the 2013 Deming Cup winners. This is a prize that we established four years ago for CEOs that emulate the Deming principles in their organizations. And I'm sure both Professor Chan and Professor Weintraub are gonna tell you what Deming has been in, in influencing American and world industry. Mr. Roca began his career at Techin in 1985 following a stint at the World Bank. Uh, Techin, a group of companies specializing in steel manufacturing, engineering, construction, and activities for the energy industry. In 1990, he was appointed CEO of Siderca, an Argentine seamless steel producer. Following a series of acquisitions in 2002, the steel tube companies were consolidating under the name of Tenaris. It currently has operations in Africa, Asia, Europe, and North and South America and a direct presence in most major oil and gas markets. Today, Mr. Roca is the chairman and CEO of Tenaris and of the Techin Group. It is a company with a clear mission statement and a well-defined set of values focused on the pursuit of excellence and managing with a long-term perspective. As a leader, Mr. Roca demonstrates that these principles are best communicated by example, inspiring employees to give their best, he makes constant efforts to meet and engage with employees at all levels in the company, encouraging their participation and stimulating their efforts. Paolo, it's a pleasure to have you here. Welcome. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Nelson, and th thank you, all of you, for this invitation. Great opportunity for me to meet you to present Tenaris, uh, uh, and um, in the end to try to um, convince, convince you that industrial activity is very interesting, it's fascinating, and uh, is an, a very important and dynamic part of our economy. Sometimes this is something that is neglected in the business school, but uh, service activity have uh, uh, receive most of the attention, but basic manufacturing industrial activity are very interesting, at, at least uh, are the area in which I committed a large part of my life. Let me introduce briefly Tenaris. Uh, Tenaris is a world leader in uh, supplying seamless and welded pipe to the energy industry. Basically, we supply all the pipe worldwide that are needed for drilling wells that goes to oil and gas and transportation of hydrocarbon pipeline and so. is uh, a world leader, uh, focus uh, on more demanding application. We have a, a, um, a share in this application that is in the range of 30% of the worldwide demand. is number one in what it do. Stenaris is a company with, uh, that employs uh, more than 27,000 people, invoice around 10, uh, 11 billion, between 11 and 12 billion uh, dollars per year. 
uh, has a value, is listed uh, in Wall Street, in Milan, in Mexico, and in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, with a value in the range of 27 uh, billion, is the largest company in his, in his realm. Uh, Tenaris uh, is, a, is a, the strategy of Tenaris is based on differentiation, differentiation uh, based on product development, on service development, on industrial excellence, and on innovation in supply chain information technology related to our business. We serve, we have the, uh, I think is, a, uh, is a, an advantage, let's say, for building this strategic positioning. Uh, we serve in an in industry that is growing, has been growing for a, on a long-term trend, is an industry that is uh, uh, exposed to very severe risk. And this is uh, facilitating uh, the differentiation process. You can, when you have in front of you an industry like the energy industry, oil company that are pursuing complex projects and are exposed to risk, like you can imagine Macondo, the explosion of a platform uh, in, uh, in Gulf of Mexico, this accident and the risk associated with this due to extreme pressure, extreme temperature, extreme complex operational condition are training, are, are driving company that could differentiate themselves and this is the case of Tenaris. Uh, the Tenaris was born as a family control company it all started in 1954 uh, with the establishment of Siderca, a seamless pipe company in Argentina. This was uh, the, the, uh, the result of the uh, initiative of my grandfather, uh, Agostino La Rocca, immediately after the war, he started working on this project when he was in his 50s, in 1946. Uh, he established the Tequint Group. Tequint today, uh, is controlling 60% of the overall capital of Tenaris. In this sense, I say this is a family control company, even being <coughs> a listed company uh, under all means. Uh, it started at Siderca, it expanded from an industrial point of view uh, with a steel shop, uh, improving his mill, his, uh, his uh, industrial facilities. Uh, over time, uh, I assumed the position of chief executive of Siderca in 1990, many years ago, unfortunately. And uh, uh, at that point, the company was one company based in Argentina with invoicing the range of $300 million. We start a ride of expansion through globalization in different countries. Today, Tenaris has 45 different industrial facilities in country uh, from Argentina, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Mexico, United States of increasing importance called Canada, Europe, Romania, Italy, uh, in Africa, Nigeria, in uh, Indonesia, in Saudi Arabia, in Japan, in uh, China. So the company expanded over time uh, as a global company. It also uh, moved its scope from a more commodity pro product into a much more differentiated product all over these last uh, 20 years. Uh, integrated this operation with service to the oil company, just-in-time service in different parts of the world. And this has been part of the strength of the company. Today, thanks to this, uh, the company is uh, profitable, uh, the most profitable company in, the, in, our, in, our, in our realm. Uh, has an EBITDA ratio around 27%, which is probably higher than most of the oil service company uh, in, our, in our world. And uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, this expansion occurred, global operation, strengthening of industrial activity, product development, 
financial exposure in 2002, we became uh, listed in New York Stock Exchange and the company start acquiring a different value. This is what Tenari is today. Um, project for the coming year uh, includes the building that is underway of a major plant in the United States. It's an investment of 1 billion point eight. And this is moving the company following the growing, deme the growing demand and opportunities uh, that are coming from shales development. Shales will change the many things in the energy world and will also change the way Tenaris address this. This is basically uh, the company. I would uh, leave the floor open for any question because I think no. Yeah, so the format of the rest of the lecture is that uh, we'll have some questions uh, from the panel and then we'll open it from uh, Q&A from the audience. Well, I should also mention we have a list, uh, RTAs have lists that will go around the room, so please sign uh, your name. So let me, that's for the deal. Let, why don't we start uh, with a question? So, so you, one, uh, you know, the, the history of Tenaris is fascinating, and one fascinating uh, aspect is that the rapid growth, I believe, uh, in the last 10 years, you've tripled your revenues. And, but at the same time, you're offering a very high quality product. You were just talking about something very differentiated, high quality. So I w we were wondering what are the main elements of the operational strategy that ensured the company grew very quickly while maintaining uh, your high quality standards? Uh, well, uh, th this is a big challenge for manufacturing. You know? the, the how you can uh, uh, pursue a, gr a strategy of growth uh, including acquisition. Acquisition has been very important for Tenaris. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you can assure alignment of procedure and the way of working into the plants on a global scale. This is a big challenge for everywhere. Even when you, see, when you look at Toyota or the, 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 the large uh, automotive industry that operates worldwide, it's difficult for them, as it is difficult for everybody, to assure that uh, different plants in different cultures are operating the same way. But still, this is an essential component of differentiation. Your company is as strong as the weakest point of the line. In our business, you can supply a column that goes down to 7,000, 7, 6,000 meters uh, down on earth, but in the end, uh, what the client expects from us is absolute quality in very harsh and difficult co condition. This column could be assembled, built, uh, or from many different plants in the world, but you should assure the client that the standard of quality are the same. Now, this has been one of the great challenges that we had in the 90s. When we start, uh, we look at those, we start as a steel company, and we were moving into a service company. We wanted, at, at the beginning, we set to ourselves this as a target for breaking a paradigm of serving the industry. Well, to support this, uh, we had this as one of the big challenge. How we assure uh, the same way of working. I remember one, back in the 90s, at the beginning, when we were starting our journey, uh, Inspector from the oil company were coming to our plant. In, uh, and I remember I was, uh, they were staying in the plant and looking after how we were pro manufacturing the, the, the order for them. So one day I have a coffee with a guy from BP. It was an inspector for BP visiting Campana. He stayed in the plant. We had the only one plant at that time. He uh, was following his order. We spent uh, one hour taking a, co a coffee. I said, tell me how you see our procedure. The guy told me, look, your people have an extraordinary motivation. Is absolutely committed to what they do. They are uh, keen in, in giving, in doing everything they can, the best they can in doing this. But you know what? Every shift is working his own way. Night shift, day shift. Uh, everybody is working his own way. They still have craftsmanship you cannot scale up your business, Mr. Rocca, unless you start uh, introducing and adopting a way of assuring standards that are common among these. Now, I remember this conversation because the conversation was highlighting something that is essential for a company that wants to be 
number one world class. How you organize yourself and how you organize yourself on a, on a global scale. We did this uh, through several tools that we introduced between the 90s and 2010 because of the, the company becomes to be made m m mature in terms of tools by, by, by that time. Uh, first of all, we, we, we uh, always uh, organize the company in a centralized way, crea way creating a functional direction with the mandate to assure common process and work instruction all in our, in our system. We centralize all of the supply chain. We have production unit, one supply chain, front end all around the world in one integrated company. The tradition of the steel industry was to manage global company on the basis of profit center. Profit center like Mittal is doing. Profit center for US, profit center for Europe, profit center for different regionally. We change this paradigm. We say this is one profit center. Front end, supply chain, production unit, functional structure that look after this, and tools like one unique procurement structure worldwide, one um, system of training. It's called Tenaris University that is assuring the same training everywhere in the world from uh, Japan to Indonesia to Argentina to Italy to everywhere. The same material, the same way of uh, delivering uh, training to this. And then we launch project. We have one project, it's 00100, we call it zero accident, zero defect, 100% compliance with the demand of the client. And under this umbrella of the project, we have continuous improvement, other projects, engineering alignment, and so on. And we invest a lot in the central function. This is, uh, I think, has been a key in building over 20 years a company that has a very high level of integration. Our client consider this a differentiator, and they give value to this. And in the end, value means they are prepared to pay a different price. They are prepared to pay a higher price. That is, in the end, the key of differentiation, no? because mm -hmm. it all goes there. Great, so as a, a follow-up, you're saying that there's a, a common standard across uh, the company, uh, but we were hoping that you could tell us a little bit about the fact that uh, Tenaris is, of course, a global company. So how do you uh, take care of the different local realities and incorporate that with maintaining a uniform operations throughout all the different plants? Well, uh, as I was saying before, uh, we introduce, uh, we have all uh, central common system. For instance, for measurement of industrial operation, we have uh, in the intranet, uh, a Tenaris management control system that in real time is given as, is measured in the op industrial operation worldwide on the same criteria. It means that from my desk, I can open my computer and I can navigate through the Tenaris management control and understand time utilization of uh, a threading machine in Indonesia or a rolling mill in Mexico or a steel shop in this. And I can see the entire time use, rejection, performance, production, and payment simultaneously. The fact that this is all uh, concentrated in one system, and it took a long time to build it over time, allow us to send the same criteria. No, the same is, apply, is applied to health and safety uh, system, quality system, and work instruction. So for instance, the way we process, we, pr we, we operate a specific complex process, uh, uh, is reflected in work instruction that are then aligned worldwide. Taking into consideration uh, the difference in the equipment, the difference in the culture sometimes, and uh, uh, trying to cope with this. This is never perfect, but is important. Uh, we try continuously to learn, to learn from other, to learn from global companies that we consider are operating a manufacturer in a way that is world class. There is a lot to do, Manufacturing is not fast. You move slow. You never can, in a plant, uh, you can, uh, you have 20,000 people working in a plant. You do not move 20,000 people working in Japan and so at the same pace uh, um, without strong leadership 
in this functional area, strong leadership in the area management and so on. But this is the endeavor and this is what we have been building in the last 20 years. Eh? And we still have a, a way to go considering the introduction, the innovation, information technology, and what information technology allow us to do for our client. Following a product by pi by pi. I mean, there are a lot of things we can do managing larger amount of data. But in an industrial company, this uh, is a slow process. It's not an easy, it's not internet-based business that you can move fast, let's say. But we are pushing and focusing on this. Huh? It seems that, uh, as a follow-up, Paolo, it seems that you have some sort of common set of values, and yet you're dealing with different corporate culture, uh, different cultures, but one corporate culture. How are these transmitted throughout all to all the workers around the world? Uh, this is a uh, this is a big a big challenge uh, for us. Uh, the value of the company. Remember, this company has been built uh, by the initiative of entrepreneur. My grandfather uh, was an entrepreneur. He left Italy immediately after the war, started his own business, uh, uh, with financed by um, friends, families, but not with his own money only. So he was always, uh, let's say, responding shareholder but investing his own money in the business and this started in 1946. Now this way of starting uh, create the base of values for our company. The strong relation between the community and the, the company, the client, the supplier. I mean a company, uh, an industrial company has a large range of stakeholders and this is uh, I think uh, the, uh, the fascinating aspect of manufacturing. Manufacturing is not uh, abstract in, in the sky. Manufacturing is only related to community. You have your footprint in the community. The footprint is in the environment, but it's also a footprint into the education, the progress, the social, economic, political progress of the community. So this it was a strong influence in the values uh, of the company. Uh, it created the, the trust uh, that is, in the end, at the core of uh, uh, the strength of the company. But if I should say today, value like the, the value that are core for us, are safety, no doubt, is value number one. Because safety is not only the question of having a, an industrial operation that is safe, but it is a message to the community, the worker, everybody. Uh, it is a commitment to the long-term well-being of people. It's a commitment of a work that is safe and easy. Safe, safety is something that goes beyond the simple concept of safety. Uh, a second strong value is ethic and fairness. I mean, uh, it comes from the beginning and it goes through all of our story. Uh, we need a company that in the end has a strong internal ethics, but also has a strong ethics with the community in which is involved, with the, the client, the supplier, and the, the shareholder, the stakeholder of this. E ethics is extremely important. You need this uh, uh, in every aspect of your work. When you evaluate uh, people that work from you, when you decide how to interpret contract, when you decide how to uh, assign uh, investment in, in different um, mills, uh, you should be guided by a deep sense of what you consider correct, why, and so on. I mean, ethics is something that is in every aspect of our job. And it's very strong as a concept and this value in our company. Uh, another value is quality. You need to look for quality in everything you do even if it's not core. Our core is producing seamless pipe or steel, but you need quality in everything you do. You need to look for it uh, in the way you organize uh, every process in your company. This has been a value. Now, um, the, the, uh, this commitment to the community, I was saying, start from the very beginning. Uh, Campana is the company country, the, the, the company town in which, from which we started, uh, really uh, 
influence the relation between the industry and the company town uh, and the vision of an immigrant is influencing all the value of this. Trust, the, the, the uh, reliance of labor, of hard work, because in the end the immigrants uh, only rely on their works. They have no heritage, no other things. So the culture of work uh, is something that goes through the years uh, and it survives a, a very strong component of our culture even 50 years after uh, the founding of this. How we translate this? Uh, we, we spend time and effort on communication on every aspect. We have an, an intranet and tenaris today that continuously project to everybody in. Today, I think we have in, uh, in uh, almost every language. We go to Indonesian, uh, to Japan, uh, to Romania, to China, to uh, Italy, to, can to Canada, I mean, to in English, in Spanish, in Romania, in every, <coughs> in every language, <coughs> set of news and information. Uh, this is very important. It projects what the company is doing, but it projects values of what we are doing. I personally write a letter every month since the last uh, six years to all of the employees, commenting what is happening every month and uh, many times stressing uh, opportunities or issues in which uh, values of the company are challenged or are confirmed or are questioned or are changing. Now, this uh, is something that we are trying to have uh, down the line. Our manager uh, doing the same and in their own area of responsibility. Now, the Tenaris University, a system of training, uh, is also a way to distribute this. We have course on leadership, course on different aspects of the, the, the activity of Tenaris, and we move people around. We have uh, induction camps in uh, one in Siderka, industrial school in, uh, in Mexico, uh, other area process school in, uh, in Italy. I mean, we tend to project this and use the Naris University to form and align uh, the culture of this. Where is our big challenge? US, integration of Latin and uh, Anglo-Saxon culture is probably one of the big ch challenge for us uh, now and in the time to come because uh, we need to, 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 to change uh, part of our culture to adapt continuously and to build a, a company that, in my view, is a, a, a bicultural company. This is a change compared to what we have done, let's say, in the last uh, in the last ten years, eh, in the last twenty years, eh? and this is uh, one of our challenge challenge for the, the time to come. No? Thank you, Paolo. What we're going to do now is leave it open, and we have Nachi and, and Jose with mics, right? So if you uh, rise, raise your hand, uh, wait until the mic comes, say who you are, and ask your question. <coughs> so one question is there, which, who's the second one? You always have a process moving, <laughs> <laughs> right? <They're just laughs> so the two mics have to be deployed. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much for your time here today. My name is Nicholas. I'm from Argentina originally, so a lot of things resonate with me. Um, my question to you is, you mentioned an important part of your strategy is through acquisition. So I was wondering if you could share with the class um, what has maybe been your hardest acquisition, uh, what was so hard about it, and how you finally got them on board to the systems and quality standards that uh, you spread across the organization. Well, there are, uh, let's say, uh, challenges that are, uh, I would say, that has been very demanding for us. Uh, Japan, for sure, has been a demanding environment. We negotiated for a long time. In the end, we ended into a joint venture uh, in which we have 51% and GFE has 49%. We built a company in which we manage, uh, the, 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 let's say, an industrial facility in Kawasaki, close to uh, Tokyo. And uh, from Japan, uh, we uh, coordinate commercial activity also uh, in the region, uh, Japan, including Korea. But the integration of Japan into, into our culture has been, uh, the negotiation of the, the agreement uh, has been an extremely complex uh, 
activity and there's been one probably of the most uh, demanding uh, endeavor for us. But uh, it takes time. Uh, when you go there today, in uh, let's say five, six years, eight, ten years after, because we started this joint venture ten years after, uh, today we are start moving Japanese outside uh, as expatriate in different places, and we have expatriate from a different country, Argentina, Italy, Mexico, uh, coming into Japan, interchanging cultural. See. And uh, this is working. And it's working well. The company is profitable. But it uh, survived the crisis that Japan had and the, is, behavior, is uh, giving better results than other companies, even in the same sector. And it's working. Now, it took a lot of time. But gradually, also Japanese culture, there is a, a, a mutual sharing. And our people need to learn, appreciate, enter, and understand uh, many, many things. You need special people to do this. You need to continuously focus on the need to have a deep understanding. This you do not do it only on the plant floor. You do it by exposing yourself to the culture, by reading, when, by staying into the culture, understanding what, how people uh, face and solve problems. And then when you're there, girl, uh, you find the extreme richness of this, and you can study very well synergy. I make an example. Um, we need to develop and to grow in uh, video identification technology for many, many things. Identification of defect and so. At the beginning, all of this was developed uh, from our activity in Argentina, in Mexico, Italy, and so. Gradually, we start to understand that in Japan, in Tokyo, in the core of, of uh, Japan, you had the most extraordinary know-how in identifying the fact for the automotive industry, uh, probably much more than what we can uh, access uh, from different countries. So we started developing group of people, young people, that could take advantage of the environment. They are close to this technology. They could bring into our system uh, state-of-the-art uh, technique and know-how and will is and they find motivation in this. So you start building synergies. Everything that you do that um, uh, create a win-win situation make you one step closer to integration. But still, it takes time. This has been a very complex integration. Uh, but the United States is not easy for us because the Latin culture is very much focused on trust, on the relation between person. In the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, you, there is a much more institutional approach. People is uh, working on the rule. They uh, look uh, at the process with a different view, and they look at the relation between people with different view. Their commitment is a professional commitment, but it's very difficult to have the same time of full life commitment that we are having in Latin work. In the Latin work we have, uh, our people are getting as young professional, it gets to the top of the company from young professional. US is different. You have uh, a, a different relation with job. This has been a difficult, a difficult integration, and we are now in the process with a new plan substantial increase in operation of uh, building a, an Anglo-Saxon soul for our company. This is my target, to have a strong Anglo-Saxon American soul for our company. When we concluded the plant, when we will be running on it in 2016 or 17, Tenari should be different. There must be a soul that will be the result of combination and there must be the, 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 um, a, a, a leadership that is not only coming from this Latin origin. It's challenging. We have seen Schlumberger as an example that takes uh, many years, uh, but it's been able to build a bridge between European culture and Latin culture and uh, uh, so I would say Japan has been a difficult integration, US has been a very difficult uh, uh, integration. Uh, but every case is different.
and there are areas in which you immediately find fit and areas in the, which is, the, for instance, Romania mm. uh, has been the integration with the Romania has been uh, very has been very easy from our point of view compared to the other that was mentioned. So where's the mic? Hi, I'm Jesse. Um, I actually did a stock pitch on your company. We, we chose to go long, so. Um, <laughs> um, just wondering, I know that shell fracking is becoming increasingly more difficult to extract the gas. Um, so I know that steel piping has become increasingly more sophisticated. So how's your company keeping up with changing your facilities to maintain the sophistication needed to keep up with the, with the technology? Have investment. The company, the, the, the big competitive advantage, the Kyoto Tenaris, Tenaris is a company with, uh, say, 27% EBITDA ratio means that we are generating around uh, a free cash flow that is substantial. The EBITDA is around uh, 3 billion plus. We invest uh, substantially in the facility to continuously uh, update process, process control and technology for the control. Uh, the company has uh, no debt, net uh, cash, so it's, it's the strongest player in our world. This is very important. When we discuss with the oil company, this is considered a uh, plus, because we are prepared to, uh, uh, to, to, to get and accept any challenge in terms of uh, technology, uh, research and development that could come. And this is what we do with Shell, with uh, Exxon, with the major oil company, but not only with major, we understand the problem and we get into the design of the column. And when we spot limits, an example is Gulf of Mexico, after Macondo mm. uh, disaster, all the rules for drilling wells in the Gulf of Mexico has been changed. The level of, sec of security and the level of redundancy in the design of the economy has been changed, and this is changing the technology of producing the pipes and producing the connection. Remember, a pipe of uh, 10 inch that goes 7,000 meter down, you can imagine, and turn, rotate, goes down, is trapped, uh, can stand pressure in the range of 20, thousand psi of temperature, extreme temperature, which means expansion, compression, and so is very challenging. Now, the change of standard uh, is something that fits into our research and development. We have a research and development center in Argentina, in Mexico, in Italy, in Japan, in the United States. The f they, they, all of them work in close coordination. They distribute the product, and we have uh, uh, routine uh, control of project advance global, worldwide. Uh, this is uh, the way we uh, perceive, analyze the request, the demand from the field, and, tra and translate this in R&D. We establish uh, in the last uh, seven years a very strong field assistance uh, group that work into the platform, into the wells, uh, supporting the client. This has been essential in understanding the need of the client and feeding our research and development plan and allowing us to fix priority. This has been essential. The center for R&D in uh, Italy is focused on process. It's focused on process R&D and it translates the requirement of the new product design into update or intervention on the process. We are, uh, our process goes from the steel shop, from steel making, uh, to rolling, to heat treatment, uh, to threading for the different uh, kind of connection that allow the pipe to, uh, to be connected into the column. So, this is how we structure this, which is the next horizon for this. The next horizon is to see if uh, the business, uh, uh, the 
business pro proposition that today bring us to the use of the pipe and the column may change and we should move one step ahead in terms of service. This is something that we continuously analyze and see if uh, we can differentiate better one step more or we should stay where we are to build differentiation because in the end uh, this is uh, something that we can never allow us, we can never allow someone to redefine the business as we did. We break all the paradigm back in the 90s and over 2000, but we have to be very careful that nobody does the same, redefine the paradigm of the, of the, of the, the business eh, in a way that uh, leave us off -site. Um, my name is Guy, and I heard when you listed the countries that you work in, China came in last, and India wasn't there at all. Uh, based on that, uh, apart from the U.S., where it's obvious why you have the operations there, do you prefer to work in countries where the culture is more accessible to their employees, or you have use for the product in a closer area? No, we should be where the action is. Where the oil company is, we should be. In the case of China, we are there. In the case of India, India is a very important country and has important uh, oil and gas reserves. Uh, but the way it works uh, in India, we didn't identify a business model that give value to quality. Our problem is not to have low, cheap manpower or pay uh, low cost manpower. Our issue is to have skilled people that we could be, could be in, in uh, let's say, uh, could be part of a very differentiated model. This is the essential thing. So for us, we do not look at India from the point of view of the, which could be the cost of manpower. We look at India from the point of view of the perspective of the oil and gas industry and their attention to quality. And we feel that uh, it's very difficult to find a profitable business model there. And you can see this when you look at the value of the, 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 the company that are in our sector in India. It's very, very small. But we learn also over time that the most difficult conversion is to change a company that is low-end into a high-end proposition. The culture of cost-oriented low-end is almost impossible to translate into high-end. So, and we experienced this in the past. When you try to change this, you need, for instance, when we, in the United States, we acquire a company, a very sophisticated technological company that is hydrid, that was producing connection, we immediately got the, 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 the synergies and introduction. When we try to do the same, we low-end facility, trying to upgrade and change the culture, we face something that for me has been extremely difficult to overcome. In the case of India, we never find business model and target that could fit with our model. In the case of, in, of India, in the case of China, uh, we decided to, to, uh, to have no partnership to operate our own. We built from a greenfield plant, 100% operated, for the most demanding quality segment. We supply today offshore and uh, sophisticated shale demand, shell and from major oil company, but also Tarim, which are the uh, Urumqi, uh, extreme west of China field. There are the most complex corrosive field uh, in which uh, we can make a difference that uh, the oil field are appreciating. So we have a facility focused on the high end. And we will want to stay there because to make money in China on the low end is impossible. If you look at the results of all of the mill in the last uh, five years, 95% uh, of them are state-owned company, and 100% of them are losing money. And the government is there to pay, but this is not our business. Our business is different. So we stay away. We stay on a scale that is manageable for a high end. And this is something that uh, we follow uh, 
worldwide. And we learn it, I would say, the hard way. In uh, the question of low end, high end, has been something that has been a key component of our long journey during this year. Hi, I'm Peter Sanson. You mentioned uh, that you can uh, monitor the capacity utilization of machines, I think it was in Indonesia, from afar. Um, how do you use that information, and are there other cool examples of how you use information technology to uh, control your operations? Well, uh, you, uh, the, the fact that you, the, the, the important point is not that I am able to access this information. The important point is that if you have one uh, system that is shared among everybody, they use it at the plant level to understand and improve, and we can control at different level, at every level, at the functional level and the area manager level. They have the same information. Now, we have bi-weekly meeting of all the industrial facility, and we discuss the laggards, the problem, the thing, and you have the same set of data. So you are discussing bi-weekly on a conference. The company uh, is very much integrated. The major process are, uh, are carried on on a bi-weekly basis, on a weekly basis, in conference uh, that uh, on uh, time, uh, time difference, uh, in the different time, in time zone, uh, try to harmonize the time zone uh, to have worldwide participation into it. Uh, six in the morning in Calgary, 12 o'clock in Japan, and uh, you got this. In that kind of meeting and so, it's very essential the, 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 the fact that uh, you have the same standard for, me for measuring and uh, understanding what is going on. It's one of the key of aligning manufacturing system to measure it in the same way. I mentioned one thing, which is time, possible time utilization, effective time and so on, but there are many variables concerning quality, uh, production, so there are also, uh, you need to follow the same way. When you align the control system, you align the language. Aligning the language and the principle is creating the basis for continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is leading you to a competitive differentiation. I think uh, it's been a, a big achievement. No other company in the world, uh, in our field, uh, are uh, invested so much in building this but I think we are getting the return for it. It's one of the key of manufacturing. Now, we talk about manufacturing. I don't know if there is interest on your part of manufacturing. Let me make one question to you. I mean, how many of you would consider going to work into manufacturing company? Not finance, not system. Well, well good number. <laughs> so this is, a, this is a, let's say, a good news. Because sometimes, in some of the university, you see people that look at uh, manufacturing as a place in which, in the end, uh, inevitably careers are uh, longer, in which uh, the commitment that requires industrial operational uh, is strong, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, they choose other things. I have a question on that on that point. Um, you mentioned that you know bringing your culture is very important and trying to build up a new culture. What's your approach, for example, now in this new greenfield that you're planning to build in the USA to recruiting so many people from the you know the people in the plant all over to the management? Uh, what's your planning your strategy to recruit all all that people you're going to need? Well, we are, we are the, the truth. We are uh, in the process of doing. This. Because uh, in the end, uh, uh, when you invest 1 million point eight, you do not, not only build the plant. You are replanning uh, all the way you arrive to the client. You are imagining a different system in which distribution changes the role. We need to serve every rigs. In the US, there are 1,800 rigs working every day. This is our target. We should imagine how they work, how we get with our pipe, how we skip all the, tra all the distribution line and we get with accessory, with what they need uh, there. So this is change of model, and this, it needs people. How we look at this? I think you, know, you need uh, to be 
able to attract young people into a young professional program, putting them into the challenge of building a new plant, which is a big challenge, putting them into the, the challenge of building a new model, and be able to, to get them uh, involved into this, and get the involvement that we have been able to get in other region, in other, for similar endeavor. It means that we will hire, I mean, we will need massive hiring. We are going to Texas A&M and uh, to the university in the south of the United, of the United States. I'm coming here, by the way. <laughs> so that's the reason I'm here. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> my agenda, <laughs> trying to tell you that uh, it's worth considering, <laughs> let's say. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, casually, I also have the chief of the uh, human resources for <laughs> North America, <laughs> Paola Mazzolini, the Italian, but he's here, that is ready to take your name. But anyway, uh, this is, uh, I'm doing this. Now, if you tell me, do you have a clear path of this? No, we never did it in the past. This is so big, the US is so different. Remember, in the US, in the US you consume 40% of the pipe consumed in the world. So this is a, a world apart. And uh, Shell is a world apart. In five years, uh, the United States uh, has changed dramatically their energy landscape. Now, they are changing also the manufacturing landscape. The US will have a competitive advantage in energy that is here to stay and to stay for long. This is the basis of a recovery of manufacturing here. So there are so many things going on that we do not know how this will turn. But we are in the present building the building, uh, the, the plant will go on, uh, we, everything is uh, in, under mobilization and we are recruiting. And uh, in, Increasing. Today we have 2,000 people, 2,500 people in the US, but we need to, to, to think of a different, of a different uh, scale and quality and, uh, uh, let's say, potential of our operation. To get potential, you need to convince people that uh, your project is fascinating, that you can do something that the other have not done, and this is something that uh, is attractive, is new. Maybe la last question. Hi, uh, could you talk about the uh, pace of innovation in your business and how you manage that? Sorry, if I talk about innovation. The pace of innovation in, in your business and then how uh, Tenaris manages that? Uh, I didn't say that the, uh, yeah, which? The base, uh, uh, the pace of innovation. Oh, sorry, I didn't understand the, the, the pace. Uh, well, I would say that we, we step up the pace and the pace of investment in 2000 in the last 10 years. Uh, uh, because when we started accessing to the most complex product, remember we started as a company that was commodity player back uh, in the 80s, uh, and starting from the 90s, we upgrade gradually. Now, when we start getting close to the complex project, immediately you multiply the number of line of action for uh, innovation. You can innovate uh, in everything, from supply chain to product design, to steel design, to information technology related to uh, the product you are selling. So in the last, I would say, uh, 10 years, uh, the pace uh, has been uh, structurally higher. And in front of us, uh, we have another step up because shales are bringing new challenges. Uh, and uh, the risk, uh, the, 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 the field that there are under development now are more and more complex. 10 years ago, five years ago, we were drilling in 1,500 feet, 500 meter of water. Today we are drilling in 
3,000, 3,500. We are going for 2,500 meters of water. The complexity of deeper, uh, deeper water and deeper well is huge. Because when you drill in 3,000, every risk is a systemic risk. You cannot, let's say, uh, solve it easily. So the, requi the requirement in terms of materials are increasing. Our pace of research uh, is increasing continuously. The more close we get to the, 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 the challenges uh, of the, this new generation of development. Uh, do we have a limit? Uh, I don't know. It depends if we can step, let's say sidestep. Today we are developing a product. Maybe tomorrow we may develop something more related to drilling technology. This is a sidestep. We will, could change the business model, but I don't know. We are continually thinking and debating among ourselves if there is a sidetrack that we should uh, do. We did it in the past, but we do not know if we have another one in front of us now. Okay, great. So why don't we take this opportunity to thank Mr. Roca for his time. <laughs>